what are they what is an audience expecting mm. what I, and I don't know what they're expecting you never really know but like I think also what I was really interested in is looking at going the complete opposite direction it's like well actually I don't want to do anything about the Australian identity it's been done to death mm. we and the Australian identity is ongoing mm. it's not it's it hasn't it's not static it hasn't stopped you know it, yeah. it, it is continuing because of the way of our makeup of our nation we are over like a 52 percent or something of 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 our population was born overseas now yeah so actually we are we are fully a nation of migrants mm. you know we're in in that which is incredible mm. and i think so the idea of leaning too much into the identity was really tricky for me so i kind of was more interested in looking at what the identity of the relationships were within that collaborative kind of performance space mm. and also what the relationship is within the or between the audience and the performer mm. but so therefore kind of acknowledging the identity of the proscenium you know, you know 256 years or something you know that proscenium theaters have been here on what is now called australia but everyone first peoples across the world mm. doesn't matter where you come from we're telling stories before a proscenium so how then for me as a first nations artist can i push through that proscenium and how can I make small gestures or how can I flex the very, very rigidness of a structural theatre mm. to acknowledge those ideas, I think, within the larger concept of identity. You know, yeah. It's really, yeah. I mean, it is, a, I, I found it a very intimidating, um, like you said, word as an umbrella for the program identity mm. because Initially, my brief was capturing 60 years of history, tradition and culture at the Australian Ballet. And I thought, oh, that's a big responsibility because <laughs> it's not just my, my you know, um, memories of what it was for me, but it's your memories of what the Australian Ballet is and the dancers' memories and everybody who's been in the audience and followed people's careers and to capture everyone's expectations of what it means to be the Australian Ballet, how they, how that looks, how they see that, their relationship with that is huge. And to acknowledge 60 years of history in 60 minutes, which is like a year a minute. Yeah, wow. Um, so I found that intimidating, but also to work out who we actually are mm -hmm. as a voice. Mm -hmm. And that is a mix of so much, you know, we started as a sort of a spin-off of the Ballet Russe. Yeah. And then we developed into having an injection of English in there with Peggy Van Prague bringing that syllabus out. And so we had, you know, a bit of the Russian syllabus and a bit of the English. And then we had an injection of, you know, American choreographers, the voice of Balanchine and Robbins and all of that coming in. And, and the whole time we were exercising our, our sounds, our approach to work, our Australian accent to those works and how we approach that you know material with our mm. our sound and our energy and so again it is a developing thing you know it's evolving constantly how we sound and how we look with every new dancer director choreographer injection of different repertoire mm. it's a changing landscape yeah. but um to really distill what it is to be in the company to be part of the company and embody that spirit as well as being the national company and what that means to the country and to audiences and who we are to them and and you know I, I tried to really look at the Australian accent and I really like to think of it as being as open-minded and as open-hearted as you know the vast landscape in Australia we've got this breadth and depth and I think as dancers we approach work with a level of that fearlessness and mm. openness but um to capture the identity you know was a really intimidating thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah no absolutely and I, but i think that you know that idea of the australian accent too you know mm. um you know the ballet was founded in 1962 yeah um adt where i'm artistic director was founded in 1965 yeah. um and actually elizabeth the founder of adt was here last night oh was um, she yeah she loved the show she met david it was really sweet we got a photo she was really really lovely um you know, and she founded ADT on, um, what'd she say, expanding the horizons of contemporary dance. Yeah. Australia, because we walk on this land, and so this yeah. land should inspire us. Yeah. Dance, because that's our chosen form, and theatre to encompass all the other facets of storytelling, film, yeah. photography, visual art, um, 
the sound, the music, whatever that might be. Mm. Um, and she's got actually really interesting um, stories around that, that early period, mm. around how Australian ballet dancers were told explicitly not to go and do class at Australian Dance Theatre because they dance with no shoes. It's like, <laughs> it was really rebels. wild. I know, total <laughs> rebels. Um, but I think what's really, um, what the double bill does between mm. Paragon and, and um, The Hum is it actually showcases that breadth of landscape yeah. and it actually does, as you said, lean into the Australian accent. Yes. And the Australian accent is highly connected to this land, mm. to the vastness, to the expansiveness, you know, to this sense of um, the, uh, the hum but of, of the collaboration and, and the many, many voices mm. to looking back at Mm. An incredible legacy and a history, but also being able to celebrate where we are now Absolutely. and what we're doing. Um, look, I think I think Paragon and the what you were kind of tasked with um, is hard. That's tricky. I'm, a, I'm look. I'm soon approaching having to celebrate ADT in 2025 or 60 years as well. Um, and so I'm already starting to think about all these things too. It's like, well, how do you how do you celebrate something that as you said, every individual person has their own take on it. Yeah. They've all got their own yeah. business with it. They've all got their own understanding of it. They're all their own kind of heart, spirit and mind connection to it. Yeah. Like, how do you, yeah. How what do you is, capture all of that? Yeah. I guess you actually also have to liberate yourself to not. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like you can't. You can't please everybody. You can't no. tick all the boxes. Right? No. Like you have to be able to liberate yourself from from all that expectation and go, well, what do I want to say yeah. about the company? Well, I think there was a point where I kind of had to do that in saying, well, I still have to be authentically my voice mm -hmm. as a choreographer. I can't try and reflect everyone else's as a homage to their voices. I can do that in a different way, but you know, I need to, being tasked with that, mm. try and capture all of that in the fabric of what I'm saying and doing to get that across. But yeah, it's, it's so tricky, but I have to say, and I don't know if I, I haven't probably said this before now, but it is such a great privilege and joy mm. to be in this program with you and, and to share this identity program because, you know, we, we've danced together or mm -hmm. we've done tours together yeah. and, to be on a bill together and to celebrate the Australian dance landscape and where it is today, where we've come from, this collaboration. And even though we've been rehearsing opposite each other. Because it was the only way we could do it. Yeah, we haven't had yeah. this opportunity until no, now. No. You know, it's just been so beautiful to watch, um, firstly, the way that the energy, the injection of ADT, their energy, not just with um, your cast of people, but the beautiful energy they've brought to the entire company mm. and all of the dancers um, and and to ha share the studios with you guys, which is the first time that yeah. that's ever happened. And yeah. we've seen each other on different stages and, you know, gotten to s certain shows, but yeah. we're, of, you know, always touring in different paths. And, you know, Dan Sex was really the first time we had that opportunity to share a bill. Yeah, and absolutely. so to do this has been such a privilege for me to, to, to share a bill with one of my heroes. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so. Oh, like you said, like, it's really, yeah, we, we've toured the world and we've performed, we shared stages and like shared friendship groups, all of that. Like, yeah. The fact that we can be doing this is really special. Yeah. You know, and, and in celebration of something so iconic that yeah. the Australian Ballet being 60, you know, is really remarkable. And like for me too, being able to lead ADT in this way, like in this kind of, um, uh, way that's deeply grounded and rooted in the Australian identity every day, mm. you know, being the first First Nations Artistic Director of ADT, I get to do that naturally. Uh, that's, that's just the way I go about my day, you know, I think about all the work and, and, and all the perspectives and what we want to say through my cultural Wiradjuri First Nations lens. And so being able to, what's been really special is looking at, trying to, um, spend as much time in process as product, mm. for me is really important. And, and you would agree to this. Like Absolutely. The performance period of any show is this much, but actually from the first day you step into the studio, it adds like that. 
Yep. So it's actually all this incredible work that goes on here is what feeds this small little part yeah. that an audience sees that's only an hour. Yeah. So the expectation of that is enormous. Yeah. But for me, if I can feed that development period with generosity and you know the, um, the reciprocity of spirit and, and honesty and kindness and artistry and the many voices, um, for me then, at the end of that period, whatever the work is will be what it will be because then my hopefully it comes off as this beautiful, honest um, exploration of, of, of human identity and connection on stage. Yeah. Um, and so having the ballet dancers on Ghana country with us in ADT last mm. year was really special. They were with us for two weeks. Um, we walked on country, we, we had lots of shared meals, um, uh, long cups of tea um, and, and coffee in the green room and in the studio, long discussions about art and dance and background and mm. sharing rhythm and, and, and ideas and ideology mm. and practices. And um, it was just such a joy to do that and to, and to create this environment of, um, of care, you know, Absolutely. which was really beautiful. And, and I think for me, the one thing I take out of watching The Hum is The Hum is that much richer, I think, because of that. Absolutely. Because of the relationships, you know. Well, and in yeah. our industry, the, the relationships are everything. Absolutely. Um, and so to be able to offer that and to, and I, this is a kind of I said to David really early on when he said, would you like to? And I thought, absolutely. I would love to make a work at the Australian Ballet because of my long history with the ballet too. Mm. Um, but I just said, it's really key that your dancers spend time with us on our country the way we make work. Mm. So there is a sense of shared and is a sense of meeting point. And so that was really special actually. A really kind of potent way to dive into what Absolutely. the work was. I had no idea what the work was at the time. I literally, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of anything. I had no idea. I was like, let's just get them here and we'll figure something out. But that's the incubation period. That's Yeah, that's right. I think that's, you know, such a special part. And what's really beautiful, and I'm, I'm the same, the process, the development is where everything is poured in and discovered mm. and you're getting to know everyone and, and given that that is that much time the shows are ephemeral yeah that's that process of it is everything but what i love about that too is that you know um your dancers in that cast have had that shared experience and mm. even when the shows and the seasons finish they've got lifelong friends that's and family right. now yeah. that is a whole yeah. you know new family that yeah absolutely met. yeah so, absolutely. and that is forever yeah, and that's They'll really important, that forward. especially as a as a um, an art form. Yeah, like our our industry is tiny, mm. and so I think we are we're, we're kind of more stronger together when we're in support of each other. Mm. Um, how was it working with your icons? I want to say idols, but I don't know who your idols are. But like you know, all of the, them, the idols of the Australian ballet, right? Like yeah, David McAllister, Maddie, yeah. Stephen Heathcote, like you know, the people who I saw dance on stage. Mm. I shared the stage with a couple yeah. of them, but like. You know, it's pretty remarkable to have them all share space yeah. at the same time. I think, I think what was really nice for them as well is that as former principals, you are usually alternating nights. Mm. So your leads and you're not on every night. So to have them all on stage at the same time was, you know, not something they would have done in their careers anyway. No. Um, but yeah, look, it, I mean, it was such a privilege and honour and a little intimidating at first. Obviously, they're my heroes mm. and mentors. And, um, you know, I, I started dancing because I had them on VHS, you yeah, know, yeah, <laughs> watched them yeah, growing wow. up. And uh, to, to be on the other side and, and having, you know, David as director and then to be directing him on movement was such a beautiful exchange. Yeah. Um, because, you know, I've, I've sat in the studio and watched their journeys and, and that's been such a privilege to witness throughout mm. my career. And then for them to trust me in movement, um, you know, I wanted to make them feel confident and comfortable and they knew that I w wasn't going to give them, you know, um, unrealistic steps. So yeah. it was a conversation and it was about how um, they to, to help them feel their best selves on stage yeah. and that storytelling. And so, you know, they've got so many wonderful stories of, of the history and to be able to share that with the current company and, mm. and that exchange 
um, between the current company and those artists was really beautiful. And the support and compassion, you know, the, the respect and inspiration, you know, of having these icons in the studio for the younger company and, you know, people in their 60s and 50s and 40s um, and their generosity of selves mm. and their artistry and, yeah. um, you know, they worked so hard. It would have been so intimidating yeah, after absolutely. 20 years for some of them coming to back. To step back into a studio yeah. and put a hand on a bar and have to, you know, do class. Yeah, and let alone under the limelight with the current company yeah, the anniversary year. Yeah, that's year. right. But you make a good point, though, like around that the amount of history and knowledge that's in the marrow of their bones mm. is is something also that you can't write down. No. You can take as many photos as you want. You can write as many essays, as many reviews, as many videos as you want, but actually it doesn't replicate no. the actual what's in the body, right? No. Like that embodied knowledge. Um, that kinetic wisdom. Yeah, kinetic wisdom. That's another way of putting it, yeah. And how, how did the current company, like, were they intimidated? And also, had they done their homework to know who <laughs> these icons were? I don't, know if, <laughs> I don't know if they all had. You know, I think... I think people were probably so delighted and surprised and embracing of, you know, the alumni coming back, knowing what a, a challenge it would be, but also mm -hmm. um, the alumni coming back, for them, it would have been, right, well, I'm getting to know my body as it is now, not at what, what it was when I was at my peak, and, and I'm going to be, how am I going to feel about that? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, you know, where will that land? And I think really I like to initially focus beyond the physical form of dance mm -hmm. it's not about how many pirouettes you can do or how high you can jump but who you are now and I made sure they knew I wasn't choreographing it on them when they were at their peak yeah. in their career but on them now so all the experiences they've learned since exiting the stage left to now and how that has developed their artistry mm. and so for them to step into the studio and have a bit of self-discovery at the end of the year was a really lovely, gentle way to get started. Yeah. Um, so they could find their feet without, you know, too much pressure. Yeah. Um, and then it was really great having the current company getting to know these people over that period of time through class and rehearsals. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, there would have been intimidating moments of partnering Oh, royalty yeah but, yeah oh my god don't drop the preciousness I know, like, I know. like having Stephen Heathcote above the head I know I know but they, look it was so beautiful because they really were so nurturing and caring and and didn't um didn't take for granted the opportunity to connect with these people and learn from them and observe yeah. them and um you know these artists came in with su such generosity and openness and embracing on how of how vulnerable things would feel mm -hmm. and in doing that you know the younger ones were just so supportive and inspired that it was really it became it was so, such a beautiful um joining of vo voices that's something of voices. that you're interested in too right like in yeah. your other work around looking at um, dancers beyond what is, I guess, our prime, right? Mm. Like, that's something that you're interested in in your other yeah, work, too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, because I think we have an idea of what we think dancers look like, yeah. and you immediately think a bunhead, you mm, know, mm. tutus and tiara, and that's, that's ballet. Um, but the, the primary reason why we have technique is as a tool for storytelling. And it's about storytelling. And yes, you know, there are pirouettes and high jumps and all of that, but that's not the only way we express ourselves. Mm. And I think, you know, dance um, is for everyone. It's, mm. you, you know, it's a way of expressing joy and it's at weddings, it's a ceremonial thing around the world. And I think it's a universal language and it's a body language and that's an ageless thing. Yeah. I well, dance is instinctual. Connect. Yeah. Dance yeah. is something that we, you don't, you just feel. Yep. You know, there are some things, some stories, some things need to be told mm. that, that need to hit us in a different part of our brain around like, oh, like comprehension. And, yeah. But dance hits us in a kind of, I like to think of like a spiritual place mm. too, like a, a deeply spiritual and, and, and emotional and physical place. Mm. You know, there are some things, you can go to a play, you can go to a movie and it can affect you. But when you see dance 
or something that really you really connect with in dance it draws you forward and yeah. it really gets you in your belly and your gut it's like oh like it, it it's different it hits a different part of your brain yeah. it's, it's it is and this is kind of what the hum kind of tapped into and what i'm kind of constantly searching for in all the work i'm making at adt is around like what is how do we tell story and and what are the best tools to use mm. you know how do we how do we open a door to a possibility of connection mm. you know a piece of writing or or a play is is being very can be very didactic mm. it can tell you what i'm telling you i'm sad or i'm telling you i'm angry mm. but whereas with dance what it can do is it can open a door to a range of mm. things and as an audience member, we only ever bring into a, a theatre our day, our week, our month, you know, our, our past experiences. We bring that into, a, mm. into a, an auditorium. But the same for dancers too. We bring our experiences from the outside. Mm. We bring our stories, our relationships, our, our ideas, our concepts. We bring it into here and this is the cauldron, I suppose. This mm. is the kind of the big, um, the big coolerman that's being, everything gets mixed up in. And yeah. all the artists do that, right? And that's where again, this sense of collaboration and into something, into a, into a place of, you know, and if you open that possibility, what's made out of that is, is, is rich and real. Um, and I like to think of dance is movement. So when people come, you want to move them. Yeah. You want them to sit there and feel mm. and think and question mm. and move, mm. literally move that you want them in their seats feeling so engaged. Yeah, you want it to be an active experience, yeah, right? You don't absolutely. want them to be passive. No. Yeah, it's not. I think it should, I think dance, because we're specifically talking about mm. dance, should go beyond mm. spectacle or entertainment. Yeah, like it absolutely. Actually, it actually has to be. That wall there. Has to say something, yeah. you know, it actually has to, yeah, it's, it's that fourth wall, right? Yeah. It's that proscenium wall. Um, which then I kind of, which then I kind of think about, like, oh yeah, well that's why we always told stories in the round. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Everyone's done it. You know, mm. blackfellas do it here. Even thinking back to like Romans and gladiatorial times, like it's yep. a big stadium. Yep. Or like the greatest piece of theatre that you can go to is like the Boxing Day Test. 100,000 people hanging off a ball about that big. <laughs> like the drama and the theatre the in that's incredible. Yeah. Um, and the same for AFL, you know, like sp those sporting grounds. They are... It's a very inclusive space. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's wrapped up. Everything, all the attention is one place. Mm. There is no edge mm. to us and you. It's like, no, no, we are all here. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really, yeah, it's a really powerful kind of concept and idea. And it's, it's hard to wrangle, mm. especially when you are in the, the, the hardness and the rigidness of a proscenium theatre, mm. right? Like, how do you do that? But I guess that's our challenge. I've got a question for you. Sure. Um... How did you approach uh, collaborating with Australian ballet dancers and ADT and develop a language with them both? Mm. Was it something that, um, you know, it's a, it's a dialogue you created between the two mm. companies? Yeah, it really came out of, first of first kind of step is conversation. Yep. Um, and then we moved into improvisations and tasking. Um, and then we just kind of kept playing. We played a lot of theatre games, mm. like a lot of um, using and that's our, vo not our voice. No. Yeah, so using, people would have been. Using vocals, okay. playing, you know, um, yeah, all sorts of kind of a range of theatre games, getting people to think differently. Yeah. You know, to think not so, um, I guess, square, but thinking round. How mm. do we think holistically when we're making work? And, um, and yeah, that idea of tasking and improvisation and theatre games is not something that's practice daily I, I, for ballet dancers, no. right? Like, so it was really, it was really fun. Um, and I could tell it was hard, you know, like those first few days in Adelaide, there was, I wouldn't, it, resistance is a strong word, but there was like a really kind of strong will to want to do it, but they just, it took them a, a couple of days to actually just release and mm. let go, you know? And then from there, once everybody was on the same page of kind of self-empowerment, the work just took off. It's really interesting because with, with the nature of the ballet and not just the repertoire that we do, um, but the amount of shows we do and the amount of information we need to hold mm -hmm. and learn, it, it, there's, it's often quite um, directed at you. These are the steps, yep. these are the counts, this is the place on stage. So there's not always a great deal of self-inquiry and how mm -hmm. do I want to approach this and that mm -hmm. because that process 
that you're talking about of tasking and how does this feel and reflection and all of that yeah. is usually associated with creations and, and yeah. that those periods. So, you know, it would have been definitely out of their comfort zone, yeah. but now they've got these tools that they would never have had had they no. not experienced that. Which that's right. Which they'll take to their classical work, which is exactly. such a gift. Absolutely, and I think that's a really, you know, and as David said, like this, to, to continue to kind of curate and to grow inquisitive artists at the ballet, I think yeah. it's really important. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a really, that's just investment in them as artists mm. as well. Um, you know, I think as a dancer, you don't want to ever feel like you can only do things one way. You mm. know? So that's been a real, a real pleasure to be able to be, I guess, the facilitator of that. You Absolutely. know, and, and personally, but also organisationally, you know, to 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 bring our sense of art mm. into into the Australian ballet um, was yeah, it was a real pleasure actually to be able to do that. And it's so exciting, you know, in the anniversary year that we get to say. Mm. This is where we are now. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's um because there's so much history there. And, you know, for us to be able to be part of this program that sort of reflects the current landscape yeah. as well as and oh. the and the you know, rich voices that we have here as Australian dancers and artists and Absolutely. creatives is really great in the anniversary year. Absolutely. And the fact that, you know, um, you know, across the hum, there was um, five, six, you know, Australian artists, mm. you know, you work with all Australian artists, like the fact that this in every way is a completely kind of Australian program, mm. um, I think is really exciting um, and really speaks volumes, I think, to David's vision too, you know, that, that that's what he wants to do. And yeah. I think being, you know, obviously, and he's the first to say it, being an outsider, he doesn't know what he doesn't know, right? And so the fact that we can be here to be like, well, here's some amazing people and some ideas you mm. may not have known of before. Mm. Um, and that trust that he's kind of put there is really exciting. Mm. And, and I'm, you know, I'm grateful for that. I've known David for 10 years. Mm. Um, to, yeah, what did we, 2023. So 2013, we first crossed paths and, um, and we've stayed friends ever since. So it's really nice that we can kind of um, be doing this you know, in support, I guess, of each other and of each other's visions too. Mm. That's really that's really important as well. Mm. I think that that kind of that peer support and and, and friendship, um, yeah, is really great. Yeah. How did you? Oh, this is probably a silly question for you because you've probably done it before. But how did you go working with the full orchestra? Oh, look, I, I'm feeling so lucky to have that opportunity. Yeah. Because. I've done a lot with pre-existing scores right. uh, and that's been um, down to probably, you know, what I know and knowing what I'm getting before I do something and hearing it and eliminating an element of that risk, but also falling in love with something going, I hear this and I feel like I want to bring that to life mm. with a pre-existing score and then having the opportunity to create something from scratch. Mm. It was such a gift and privilege because for me, this story, it, it felt, I approached it like a narrative. Right. You know, I've got 60 years of history and it's like taking out what text is, you know, really important and 60 years, you know, there were landmark productions and events and moments in time and people that changed the trajectory of it, artistic directors, dancers, repertoire, and trying to curate that and putting it into a timeline and then presenting that to Christopher and saying, this is a little vignette that I want to capture and honour this and recognise mm -hmm. this moment in time and this and that. And then we'd talk about the mood for that particular piece and how that felt and you know what that needed to sound like. And then that would be, we'd be back and forth about that. So to have something composed to the story you're creating and telling was mm. so special. Yeah, amazing. Um, and it felt very integrated in, you know, from the very beginning that we were creating something together yeah. on the same page in a very, um, we we're telling the same story. Yeah. And then the designs were telling that story too. And then the costume designer, she worked to the score. So oh, as wow. well, so she'd say, oh, I'm hearing this with that music. That sounds like color, am I right? And yeah, then I'd wow. say, oh, well, 
and so we all worked with the music and the designs in mind. So it felt like when I came into the studio, I'd seen her designs and knew what they looked like and I knew what it sounded like and I knew it on set so I could see a full picture and mm. I, I could just then put the movement in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, it, I've, never, I've never felt like that before. Yeah, and wow. it was, you know, having a full orchestra and having th that palette to play with um, is like painting a picture with, you know, as a kid, it was the 72 Derwents. Yeah, <laughs> Do you remember right, those tins? Right. Yeah, yeah. You get the 72 colours and you're like, oh my gosh, this yeah. isn't just the 25 pack, you know. Yeah, wow. It's like having, you know, everything there to paint with. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'd never worked with like a classical composer before. Yeah, right. Um, and never the enormity of an orchestra. Yeah. Um, I've danced to a one before, but I've never had this kind of collaborative relationship with a composer, especially someone like Deborah Freon. Yeah. Um, and the incredible kind of icon status that she has culturally um, and artistically. Mm. Um, and I think that analogy of like that you said, like that you had the bits and pieces and then you could put your, your world within that. Um, my, my whole work was being developed kind of all at the same time. So Deborah joined us in Adelaide last year. She was with us for about 10 days of the two mm. weeks. She conducted in the room, she sang. Um, she, I even told her, I was like, well, you, well, you go, you get up and you play that game and um, you direct them. And she would get up and I'd just sit and watch her mm. literally conducting dances. And it was a really incredible kind of exchange. And mm. Nicolette came and sat in on a day mm. just so she could get an idea and a concept of like, oh, how is this feeling? And, um, and then as the score started to come in, to be honest with you, I got super overwhelmed. Right. Just because the orchestra, as you said, is so colourful. Mm. Like I listened to the score at the kind of first draft many, many months ago and I was like, wow, there is so much colour here. Where do I fit? Mm. And I really struggled with trying to find a way into something that is so rich and that is so broad and, and mm. colourful. It felt like the first listen, it felt like the picture was already painted. Right. And I had, I was like, well, where do I go? Yeah. Where does the dance go with that? Do I fight? the lyricism of it? Do I fight the beat of it? Do mm. I lean in? Like, what do I do? So a lot, some of the time I kind of decided to just lean in, mm. you know, I decided to lean into the drama of it at times, um, which is that kind of middle world yeah. reset to so the red. Mm. So I was just like, if this is dramatic, let, let's just lean in. Like, yeah. I can't fight something that's super epic like that. Um, and then utilizing this kind of the rhythm and the score and a lot of the rhythms as well came out of dancers' personal heartbeat rhythms as too. So that was one of the early tasks that we did, that all the individual dancers, they all sat with themselves for half an hour and listened to their internal rhythms and drew them. I've got all their pictures at ADT, about beautiful little drawings about what their heart rhythms look like. And then Deborah took all those away and used those as inspiration that for the score. So and, and then obviously as Deborah, being um, you know, a really strong Yorta Yorta woman, she used the landscape and, 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 and environment mm. as her inspiration as well. But it was really, once I'd made the decision, not made the decision, but once I kind of realised that I had to approach this mm. vastly differently than I would have any other score, like working with, you know, a contemporary composer who mm -hmm. makes everything on a computer, for example, mm. I, I, it kind of unlocked something. I was like, okay, I, I know now. I, I can kind of, I know that I have to approach it via this direction. Mm. You know, I felt like I couldn't go through it. Mm. I had to find another way around it. But once I did that, I kind of, I found a great liberation yeah. in that, that I was like, oh, okay, this is the world. Um, this, this stage, the scale, I've not worked on this scale and this stage before, just roll with it, Dan, mm. like just lean in. Mm. And so I did. And then, as I said, once I liberated myself from that, I found a real joy in being able to listen to her score mm. and understand it emotionally. And then by having really long, deep conversations with her, um, and then through all of that, it would filter through and I go, okay, I know how to approach that now. Mm. And then it would just kind of unfold. Um, as also with, with kind of incredible collaboration from the artist as well, just like I was hearing something, but someone else was hearing a different instrument and they're hearing an offbeat. And I'm like, okay, well, like, let's just do it and mm. let's just see how it feels. How does this physicality fit on top of that? Mm. And then let's get, go from there, you know, let's not lead by count, let's go by feel. Mm. What does it sound like? How does that instrument make you feel? And what is, what's your relationship to that? So that, that will have unlocked a whole new world for you because- Absolutely. That 
wasn't there before and now you, you've got that path. Yeah, that now I've got that kind of understanding of how to approach orchestral yeah. music. And it's not something that I've ever been overly drawn to, mm. to make to, you know. Um, I listen to classical music, but I've never heard a piece and gone, I need to make to that, you know. Maybe I will, I don't know. God, who knows? But maybe there is a whole other kind of unlocked pathway there that I'd be really interested in. I, I am really interested in, though, in, in new orchestral mm. music, you know, like new composers, compositions, mm. and, and how that works. Um, that's a really interesting because it's the same conversation, I think, what I ultimately realised is the conversations I was having with Deborah is the same conversations that I was having with other composers that I've worked with. It's just that Deborah's palette consists of 60 humans, not 60 stems on a computer, yeah. you know? And that, yeah. that for me was really rich, actually, and especially mm. hearing the score, too, the oh, first time. Going to the orchestral rehearsal and sitting there and seeing the artists play those instruments yeah. Yeah. from just rehearsing on a computer, yeah. you know, An MP3, recording, yeah. yeah, and oh, just I've, you know, a couple of times throughout my dancing career, once I got the great opportunity of sitting in the pit during oh, a show. I'd love to do that. And it was mind blowing. Yeah. You know, you're on stage and you're hearing that or you're hearing the counts and then to see the people playing, you know, all yeah. the instruments. Yeah, it's just a whole new appreciation. Amazing. What, what really hit me too, like especially on that first dress rehearsal, is you've got, I've got 18 people on stage mm. and then I've got, I think, I think it's roughly 60, I'm going to say mm. 60 anyway, people below mm. and that there's this kind of medium middle connection point that this, and I, and I, I talked to the dancers about it, I was like, there are people down there, mm. like humans playing this music, like don't forget that. And obviously, you know, Australian ballet dancers are very well aware of that, but ADT, we're not. Mm. Um, and it's very rare as a contemporary dancer to dance for a full orchestra. Mm. Um, and so that's, that, I think that's a real um, moment that I think the, my six, you know, mm. won't f just kind of soon forget, you know. Well, there's something so beautiful about energetically mm. having your feet on the ground or on point or, or you know, dancing on that stage and knowing there's the vibrations and music coming up right yeah. directly underneath because yeah. the pit goes right under the stage. Yeah, that's right. That, there's that connection. Yeah, and, and, and also highlighting the importance of the conductor. Oh, yeah. You know, like having Nicolette there, you know, we've both danced to her as she was a conductor and mm. like, it's just super amazing to have her be the one, be the mm. song woman, be the one leading mm. everyone. Mm. Like she's, she's, we were talking about it, I was like, what is, what's your role, Nicolette? I feel like you know you're trying to wrangle you're trying to pull the horses back you're trying to like no no orchestra like stay with me mm. and dancers no you know to stay with me it's like she's trying to balance the two like, mm. but she's an absolute master yeah um and just watching her work too and it's yeah. really yeah it's really inspiring it, without this is a terrible analogy but almost like a um a person in the middle that's an interpreter for both the mm. forms to to keep the, those bodies together as one. Yeah. And to be able to do that is so extraordinary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To be able to watch and connect with what they're doing and hear it and see it and feel it and conduct that. Yeah. To be in harmony together. Yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I'm looking forward to Melbourne. Yeah. Now we're open here. Yeah. I'm looking forward to Melbourne. A, because the stage is a bit wider. Um, but B, I just think also we're going to get a good run. Like we get 12 shows in a row. Consecutively. And look, also, it's like a different show in Melbourne. It's, yeah. You're viewing it from a different platform. Everything's more intimate here. Yeah. And it's, you get a, a different perspective. Mm. Um, so it'll be really, it'll be really interesting to nice. see it there. Yeah, yeah. But also, you know, that's, especially for Barragon, Melbourne's the home of the Australian Ballet. Yeah. So it's like back to home base. Back right? to home base, and also, you know, given the arts centre is going to close for a few years, yeah, it's so yeah. lovely to be able to perform there in this year before that happens, because mm. it's a full circle, really. Yeah. That feeling of our home. Yeah, and being and, there. and for ADT, ADT, at one point in our history, we were co-funded by the Victorian government. Yeah, right. Yeah, so there was actually it was they were Australian Dance Theatre. They were based in Adelaide, but they were co-funded by um, the South Australian and the Victorian government. Yeah, right. This is before Chunky Move existed. Yeah. Um, and so it's really nice that I'll get to take ADT back to the art centre yeah. um, and, and um, yeah, share that with audiences too. You know? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it'd be fun. Oh, yeah.